for Jesus, trust me, you're not going to die for him. I have never seen a man die for a cause he didn't live. It is a spiritual violence. Because we're not fighting against you. You can't use the physical to fight the spiritual. My dear friends, praise God, we have some people this morning who have made up their mind that heaven will be taken by storm. They plan to be transplanted from the kingdom of darkness this morning. Oh, into the kingdom of grace. And then into the kingdom of glory. You have loved us so much, dear, dear Father, tongue cannot tell. Yes, Lord. And you want to save each and every one of us. Yes, Lord. And you are still calling men and women to surrender their lives to you so that they can have a place in your eternal kingdom. Yes, Lord. I pray that at this moment, dear Father, you will cover your people, those who have made the decision to follow you into the watery grave of baptism. Yes, Lord. I pray, dear Father, that your Holy Spirit will take full control of them. Yes, Lord. Holy angels will protect them. Yes, Lord. Lord, wherever they have problem, we ask that you will bring deliverance, yes, Lord. that you will bring sustenance in their Father, so that they will never be the same again, and that you will work through their life each and every day, so that they may have the assurance that you are always with them. Bless them continually now, dear Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. People who come to this church, don't come for any job. Right now, you know, give me some clown here. People who come here are serious about their salvation. Final movements of God in the earth, my dear friends. Don't let this train pass you by. Do we all have a lesson? If you don't have a lesson, please raise your hand. Okay. We want to say a special welcome to those who are viewing us via live stream. We thank God for your presence online. And we hope and pray that as we study together, great blessings will occur to your hearts and on, unto your minds. God is good. What do you say? And he's much better to us than we are to ourselves. Oh, that man would praise him, David says. Praise him. We are going to have a word of prayer and then get right this, this Evelyn's message. Let us, let us pray. Almighty God who art in heaven, we approach your throne of grace and mercy in the awesome name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are about to look into your inspired book, and we ask for the assistance of the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, to enlighten our understanding and to bring the eternal things to reality. Lord, may none sleep this morning. It was while man slept, the enemy came and sowed tears and went his way. Keep us alive, we pray, and awake. So we will hear that you have to speak to us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, if you, don't, if you still haven't gotten a lesson, keep your hands up, please. <clears throat> Brother Sheridan, a little more volume. Thank you. All right, for those who are with us for the very first time, we have been doing a series on the book, The Pilgrim's Progress, the allegory written by the beloved Puritan John Bunyan, who spent 12 years of his life in a jail in Bedford, England. That was where he wrote, many believe, the first half of the book, and when he was released, we learned last week that he finished the remaining half. It's an allegory about a man's journey from the city of destruction to the celestial city. This book is a very good book. 
And we want to encourage you to get a copy. We have come to a readerless generation. People don't read anymore, and those who are reading are reading the wrong things. But for those who still believe in reading, get a copy for yourself, a hardback copy, and read it. Ellen White says that the book, The Pilgrim's Progress, not in your handout, it portrays the Christian's life so accurately. If you're a Christian, you will see yourself in this book. You will see yourself in the characters. And it also presents the love of Christ so attractively. And through its instrumentalities, hundreds and thousands have been converted to Jesus because of this book, The Pilgrim's Progress. Now, last week, I kind of jumped the gun and I did not give you the interpretation of ignorance. So just jot this down on your lesson and when you go home, please fill it in. It was uh, my mistake. Now, last week, for those who weren't here, we looked at ignorance. And ignorance, we looked at, fill it in, just, 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 just read now. It represents those false pilgrims who will hold to their false view, underscore false view, false view of Christianity in spite of clear biblical revelation. These are the ignorant people. And we looked at, there were two classes. You had the sincere ignorance and you had the willfully ignorant who, in spite of the clear biblical revelation, they will hold to their dubious and damnable and devilish and diabolical doctrines. Doctrines of devils. Now we've come to a very unfortunate character. I wish I could gloss over him, but I can't. We're on lesson number 63. His name is Mr. Turnaway. Now, remember we said this book is biblical. All the characters are biblical. Mr. Turnaway, or a.k.a. apostasy, Mr. Apostasy. Now, he's mentioned in the Bible. You can jot this text down. 2 Timothy 4.4, 4, we find Mr. Turnaway, the Apostle Paul writes, verse 4, and they shall what? There it is. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Bunyan got this character from 2 Timothy 4.4, 4, Mr. Turnaway. This book is biblical. The characters are biblical. Now, when last we left Hopeful and Christian, they had met Mr. Uh, Ignorance, and now they meet another character. His name is Mr. Turnaway, and I'm going to ask Sister, not my wife, to please read for us. Now, we're starting in the first paragraph in your lesson study. Please read. Bunyan. Now when they had passed him a little way, they entered into a very dark lane, where they met a man whom seven devils had bound with seven strong cords, and were carrying him back to the door that they saw on the side of the hill. Now good Christian began to tremble, and so did hopeful his companion. Yet, as the devils led away the man, Christian looked to see if he knew him, and he thought it might be one turn away that dwelt in the town of apostasy. But he did not perfectly see his face, for he did hang his head like a thief that is found. But... Being gone past, Hopeful looked after him and espied on his back a paper with this inscription, Wanton Professor and Damnable Apostate. Then said Christian to his fellow, Now I call to my remembrance that which was told me of a thing that happened to a good man hereabout. The name of that man was Little Faith, but a good man, and he dwelt in the town of Sincere. All right, we will stop there. And we will take a look at this character. Now, beloved, the book is an allegory. It means you have to look beneath the surface. Is that right? Now, fill it in now. Who does Mr. Turnaway represent? Fill it in now, the red. Turnaway represents those persons or institutions who will turn away from the truth and fall into apostasy. Turn away represents or symbolize those persons or institutions 
who will turn from the truth and fall into apostasy. Apostasy. You know, beloved, this word apostasy is not too frequent amongst us as a people. As a matter of fact, those who mention it are looked upon as troublers of Israel. We don't hear it too much in the press or see it written in the press or even in our publications. It is a word that is almost brought to the trash heap, but it is a serious word. Now, beloved, there are those who say when you talk about apostasy, you got to be careful. You got to tiptoe, lest you send the wrong signal. And there are those who will say, well, be careful, preacher, because some will say, well, apostasy is in the church. That's what some say. And some will say, no, 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 no. You have it backwards. It is the church is in apostasy. Now, my dear friends, whether you take the former or the latter, the fact of the matter is things are not the way they used to be. Amen. That much is abundantly clear. Not just in Babylon, but in the remnant church. A change has come. Not for the better, but for the worse. Spurgeon says some are making progress, but in the wrong direction. Now, what is this word apostasy? Now, again, it's good for us to get a biblical uh, a, a, a dictionary definition. It is defined in your handout. Apostasy is defined as a total desertion of or departure from one's religion, one's principles, one's party, or one's cause. So when we say apostasy, there is a departure from one's religious principles, one's party, or one's cause. Is that clear? Now let's begin by posing a question. Question number one in your hand says now, who was the original and first apostate? In Isaiah 14, verse 12, we don't have to guess. The Bible tells us now. Isaiah 14, verse 12, the Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? That word Lucifer means lux, er, light transfer. Stand in the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nation? So based on this text, the first and the original apostate was Lucifer. Fill it in. Lucifer. Lucifer, which now is Satan. Lucifer was the first person to abandon, to renege, to quit his religious views, his cause, his party. And not just that, he was successful in taking one third of the angels. In the spirit of prophecy, when Seventh of the Lord mentions Lucifer, she uses a strong phrase. It's only mentioned about three times, and I've gotten them in your handout, or two. In Signs of the Times, we find this. This is about the concept of Christ's cross now. The principalities and powers of darkness assembled around his cross. Christ, the arch what? Lucifer. The word arch means you have Michael the archangel. It doesn't mean he was an angel. Arch means top. So when it says the arch apostate, it means that he is the top. He's the original. Not a carbon copy. He's the original apostate. And when we find another reference in the book Temperance, she says, see the man bereft of reason. What is he? He is a slave to the will of Satan. The context about is about alcohol. The arch apostate imbues him with his own what? So my dear friends, based on scripture and the testimonies, Satan is the first original apostate, the first created being in the entire universe to renege, to abandon, to desert his religious principles, his religious cause. And what he has done in heaven, he is now seeking to carry on in earth. Number two now says, now according to Apostle Paul, what will some do in the last days? Again, he's writing to the Christian. 
the early church. Look what he says now. Now the spirit focus on the S. It's not a small case. It is an uppercase. This is the third member of the Godhead. Not your little spirit. This is the Holy Ghost now. Speaketh expressly in the latter times or in the last days. Our dispensation, some, bless God, not all. Some. And when Paul wrote, when he made his prognostication, his, his prognosis, he saw us here today. Yes. Some, not all, shall depart from the faith. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of what? Yes. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience shaved with hot iron. Then he says now, uh, this is in 1 Timothy. Then he says in 2 Thessalonians, um, 1 Thessalonians 2 1, he says, Now, now we beseech thee, beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the gathering together unto him. Ye be not soon taken in mind, or troubled neither by spirit. Notice the lowercase s, not the Holy Spirit now. This is your own being, right? No by word, no by letter, as from us, as the day of Christ is what? Then he says, Now. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day. What day? The second coming of Jesus. Right? Shall not come except there be a what? Apostasy. He wrote in his day, but it also has a latter day and end time application. So Paul says that before Christ comes, fill it in now, there will be a departure. They will get out of Dodge. Departure, fill it in now, from the faith or they will fall away. And I used to believe that this meant that churches would be empty on weekends. But my dear friends, think again. We have mega church, giga church. Joel Austin has a terabyte church now. For those who are in the gig age. It's not just a few people. But what Paul is saying is that as the bigger the church gets, the less religion you will find. And I don't know which one is worse. To have a packed church full of pure empty people or a huge church with empty pews. So it doesn't mean that folks will stop going to church. It means that the standards will fall. There will be a fall number. People won't know where they are. Whether they're going to the ball club or the church. Turn away. Uh, Mr. Spurgeon put it this way. He says, uh, no mischief that ever befalls our Christian communities is more lamentable than that which comes from the defection of the members. Amen. He says the direst calamity the church can dread is not such as will arise from the assaults of the enemies outside, but from the false brethren and the traitors within the camp. And as we look around today, there are many of us, many who used to walk with us. Now we don't see them anymore. He says now Troy, city of Troy, could, not be, could never be taken by the assaults of the Greek outside her walls. Only when the strategy, the enemy, had been admitted within this citadel was that brave city compelled to yield. He says, in all our churches, among, the, among many who enlist, there are some who desert. They continue a while and they go back to the world. The radical reason why they retire is an obvious incongruity they went out from us but they were not of us for if they had been of us they would have no doubt have continued with us he says the unconverted adherents in our fellowship are no loss to the church when they depart <laughs> they are not real a real deficit any more than the scattering of the chaff from the threshing floor is uh, the detriment to the wheat. Christ keeps the wooing fan ongoing. 
His own preaching constantly sift his hearers. There's a falling away. Now, number three now says, what heart searching question did Jesus put to every member of the remnant church? If you are a member of this church, this question asks, comes, confronts you. If you are a Christian, this question confronts you. In John chapter 6, Christ is preaching his first sermon. And it was hard. And when he got to the end of his discourse, he said then, then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you also or desert or become an apostate? Then Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Beloved, the question which confronts every individual under the hearing of my voice, whether you're a Baptist or a Jehovah's Witness or a Pentecostal or a Mormon or a non-denominational, yes. this confronts you, will you also go away? It's a serious question, a searching question. Because when the going gets tough, some are gone. The tough must get going. Note, he addressed his chosen 12, but I put it to myself. Put it to those who are officers of the church. I put it to every member of the worldwide church without exception. Will you also go away? Now, beloved, the reasons why people defect from Christianity. The remnant church are numerous. There's no one reason that we can use to put all under an umbrella. As our faces so differ, so do the plots and the assaults of the devil. Satan really caused people to defect the same way. God really saves two the same way. But whatever reasons, whatever the reasons are, there is a plot on your life by the devil to cause you to become an apostate, to defect, to desert. Now, as I survey the scriptures, I have concocted or deduced some reasons as to why people become an apostate or desert. Now, question now, why do some turn away or fall into apostasy? I give you the first reason. Fill it in now. Because they cannot bear Christ's doctrine or teachings. That's the first reason I believe many turn away, renege, quit, become an apostate, quit, give up. Because they cannot bear Christ's doctrines. You know, Christianity is not an incline religion. It is a, not a decline, it's an incline rather. It goes up, we are climbing whose ladder? Every round goes what? Have you ever been to the, uh, the, the gym? I hope some of us go. The other day, man, I, when I was in Pennsylvania, it was so cold I couldn't go on my morning run. So I went to the gym. And I saw a lady on the incline. I said, oh, sure, I can handle that, man. That's a piece of cake, man. She's just doing her thing. Man, I got on that machine. Boy, I'm telling you, man. I, I got to get off. It wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. As you're inclining, your legs began to burn. And I had to get off. I said, man, I'd rather go do something else. And as it is in the physical, so it is in the spiritual. Look what Christ said now. In the book of John 6, he's preaching his first sermon. Second sermon. Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I said to you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This is a strong sermon he's preaching now. The Bible says now in verse 59, these things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many there of his disciples, when they had heard this saying, this is a what saying? This is a hard saying, Peter. Who, who can hear it? 61 says now, and when Jesus knew himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? 
Next verse says, now 66 says, and from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They couldn't handle Christ's doctrine. Because Christ now began to bring the thing up. He began to turn up the thing. <laughs> the incline. You know, it's unfortunate. That Christianity, they oftentimes focus on the Jesus that blessed the children. Oh, we love that Jesus. Yes. We wish we could have him every day. They also love the Jesus that Fed the 5,000 with fish and whole wheat bread, somebody say. <laughs> they love the Jesus who cleansed the leper. The Jesus that oftentimes raised the dead. But my dear friends, Jesus at times doesn't just have a smile. Jesus sometimes has a frown. Jesus sometimes wears a smile, but he sometimes wears a frown. And I have come to realize that modern Christianity do not care much for the Jesus that has the frown. They want that Jesus who has that smile. There were times where Jesus had to crack the whip. Go in the synagogue and they were defiling the synagogue. He cracked up and he kicked over the tables and he, he drove those rascals with their rascality out of the sacred precincts. Matthew 3, 12 says about Jesus whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor. And many don't want this. One religious author says, we in the church have not failed to remind this generation that, that, that while Jesus is love, but we fail to remind them that he has the capacity to hate. He hates sin and he will judge it with fierceness of his wrath. This generation has been schooled in the teaching about an indulgent soft hearted Jesus whose judgments are uncertain and who cuddles those who breaks his commandment but my dear friends turn the coin over there is another side to Jesus and I want to tell you you don't want to experience that side because when he brings a man low that man stays low you ask Nebuchadnezzar Jesus was not just love, but he denounced several things in his teaching. Jot them down. He denounced pride. Did you know that? Yeah. One of the seven deadly sins. Pride. Pride of dress. And I keep on telling folks that church is not the place to be looking sexy. We come for an encounter with the Most High God. Yeah. Jesus denounced lying. Did you know that? On the line, we have fraud, embezzlement, and slander. He says, you are of the father, the devil. He's a liar. Yes. And we don't want that Jesus. Jesus also denounced murders. And in your handout, murder. He says that if a man, uh, your father is a murderer. And not just going out there to commit that actual crime. If you wish people were injured or dead. It's in your heart. Jesus also denounced lust. And when we present this kind of Jesus to folks, they don't want this kind of Jesus. They say, preacher, stop the boat, right? get off right now. I didn't sign up for that. I came for my healing. One healing to go, please. One murder to go. One praise to go. I don't have this time, time to stay for the sermon. They get off. And they quit because they cannot endure Endure the frown of Jesus. We are told in early writings, I ask the meaning of the shaking I had seen. It would be caused by the straight testimony. True witness brings it about. Some will rise up against it. And this will cause the shaking. So why do some become an apostate? Because they cannot 
endure Christ's doctrines and his teaching, so they quit religion. Others, fill it in now, because of some unsound doctrines. Some are taken away. Our opening text, we read it. For those who are filling in, we're on page number, number two, right? The reasons. Number two, why some go away? False doctrine uh, uh, because of Christ's teachings and they can't endure it. Secondly, because of unsound doctrines. And Paul spoke of it. First Timothy 4, 1 Timothy 4.1, he says, In the last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. There are some doctrines that people hold in Christianity that the devil himself invented it. Amen. You think about the doctrine of when a man dies, he goes to heaven. You really think about it. You know, as a matter of fact, you know, I tell you, my uncle passed. Thursday, he had cancer and we went down and tried to get him to the medical missionary place. But when I saw him, hey, I told my mom, final arrangement, this is it. We got him in a taxi, taking him to St. Thomas. The car went before us and we got to Yalas, about six o'clock we got the news, he's gone. My brother's a Rasta. And him said, hey, Aya. Rasta not going to house where dead people day. And my brother, did you know, did not come in the house. My brother drove from St. Thomas right back to Spanish Town that same night. Why? Because of the spirits. When I saw that man, I tell you, man, that man was dead. But it's a belief in Christianity that when a person dies... He's not really dead. That is a doctrine of the devil. Yeah. It is a satanic doctrine. And because it's so comforting. Now you think about it. If when you die, you go to heaven. Well, let's all kill ourselves, El Romeo. As a matter of fact, let's get the punch. And let's just spike it and call it, get to heaven real quick. <laughs> you really think? I mean, with all the mess we go through down here. Phone getting cut off, can't pay our bills, rebellious children, crazy boss, sick in-laws, racism, sexism, classism, elitism, all these in schism. Let's just get out of this world real quick. Why is it that when, we, when death approaches us, we are so resistant of it? And I tell folks this, you think about it. Here is a man. He's a Christian. If when you die, you go to heaven, your loved ones are looking down upon you in bliss. You think about this scenario now. Here's a man. Brother Miller, I'm going to use sister Brother Miller. Brother Miller is a Christian man, loves the Lord. His family is a Christian. Monday morning, he kisses his wife and he, has, he says, honey, I'm going to work, but dinner at seven. He goes to work. Now, he's on the turnpike. He meets an accident. He's gone. Now, if they believe that you go to heaven, he's in heaven. So he's in heaven now and he sees the police officer comes and knocks at the door. Bam, 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 bam. Sister Miller, this is officer Smokey the Bear. I got sad news. Your husband, oh, she faints. Bam. As she gets up now, she goes to the school where the kids are. She called Adrian and she said, listen now, your father isn't coming home anymore. The kids break it now. Brother Miller's in heaven, seen all of this, you know. And he's saying, mercy. By and by now, at the funeral, it's the casket, the kids are breaking down, everybody's crying. It's so sad. And, but by and by, life goes on. He's still in heaven, watch, watching it now. Sister Miller now goes to Publix to do her grocery shopping. And she sees a young dark chocolate <laughs> fella <laughs> doing his shopping. All of a sudden, bam, he bumps cart. Their eyes make four. Now, Brother Miller's in heaven now. Say, so, hold on there. What's going on there? Jesus, hold on there. What's this? And the guy says, hi. Haven't seen you around here. 
give me a number now. So she says, fine. So the man calls and he texts and finally they go on a date and first, second, third, fourth, and finally, bam, he pops the question. Now, if Brother Mill is alive, he's in heaven saying, oh, Lord, I know, I know she's going to do that. <laughs> she can't marry him. <laughs> by and by, now they get married. Now, by and by, Sister Miller had a picture of Brother Miller in the home, and this man comes in, well, he's gone, let me take it down. <laughs> <laughs> do you know how discouraging heaven would be? He would say, Jesus, get me out of this place real quick, I got to go back to earth. That is why when you are dead, you don't know anything. It's great peace. Heaven will be a very depressing place, a very jealous place, evil place. So when you die, you are. But the devil says when you die, you're not dead. And so that's a doctrine of the devil. Evangelism, we're told. One of the doctrines where many will depart from the faith is that there is no sanctuary in heaven. Many will depart from the faith. You know, Elder C.D. Brooks once said, you don't have to hate something to despise it, just fail to give it preeminence. That's a profound statement. Very profound. You don't have to say, well, there's no sanctuary. Just live your life as if we are not in the day of atonement. And you have denied. So some will leave because they can't endure Christ's doctrine. Some will leave because of unsound doctrine. Now some just leave because of just laziness. Yes. You know, we are not born lazy. Laziness is an acquired vice. It is. And I want to tell you something. Countries that afford laziness are usually first world countries. Because we have so much. Laziness is sin. Before God gave Adam, and Adam a wife, he gave him employment. His job was to till, rather train the vines. Right? In Galatians 6, 5, Paul says to the Galatian church, for every man shall bear his adjective, his own what? When you join the church, there's something for you to do. Every soldier must carry his own gun, his own canteen, his own knapsack, his own binoculars. So in the church, there is a work for you which I can do, a work for me, which you can do for me. And if it doesn't get done, it will never get done. Gospel workers said, good book, the intellect should be cultivated, the, mind, the memory should be taxed. Amen. All intellectual laziness is, we don't tax our minds anymore. When's the last time you use a map to get where you're going? And don't, if you, and some of us, if we lose our cell phone, we are out of gas. Because we barely even know our spouse's number. Now that's bad. We don't, we don't, we don't retain things anymore. Listen, when I was growing up in Jamaica, I'm telling you, the, the Jamaican system of education was tough. We had the British. See, we ain't had no eeny, meeny, man, no mother choice. Show work. And, and they wanted, they wanted, how you got the answer? We could just copy down. How you got, how you got, how you got this? Brother Not, Mr. Not, huh? Show work. And when we had history, we had to memorize dates and names and they took off for spellings. Your mind, your frontal lobe, man, was expanded. You, you knew dates. Even today, I can still memorize the three ships that, Christopher Columbus took to discover a new world. The Santa Mira, the Pinta, and the other, what is it? What is it? So you know what I'm talking about. That thing was engraved in our minds. Boy, those three ships. Santa, whatever. We know them. You don't know them, right? Because you had multiple choice. So we had that. You had to write those names. The memory. Because it's not tact, and if you don't use it, 
You're losing it. You know, Christianity, Paul says when the spirit falls upon the church, he gives several gifts. You know that? There's no person who is giftless. You have a gift, you know. And you find the gifts in Romans 12, um, 1 Corinthians, and Ephesians. Now, some church, you only focus on the gift of tongues. Where's that one? Down here somewhere. Right here. That's all they talk about. But did you know that helps is a gift? You have some folks, they just get in the way. But some people can organize. That's their gift. So if that's your gift, then organize. All of us have a gift. There's no giftless person in this church this morning. Amen. If you embrace Christ. God has given you some gift that you can use. You know, we find this scenario in the spirit of prophecy, a beehive. And Christianity, God's church, is likened to a beehive. And I'm going to read to you a powerful statement in your handout. We're told out. During the past few years, the beehive in San Francisco has been Indeed, a busy one. This was a church in, in San Francisco, right? Lines of Christian effort have been carried forward by our brethren and sisters there. These include, now look at the activity that every member was involved in. Some line, there's no lazy bee. I've never seen one. And even the queen run things, so she's not busy. But all the other bees are gathering nectar and they're doing their thing. What are some of the lines? Visiting the sick and destitute. That's a gift. Some folks, when they visit, they make you more sicker. They just come with depressing news. Oh, my head hurt. You got to leave. It's a gift. Finding homes for orphans, or, or, orphans and work for the unemployed, nursing the sick. That's what they were doing at the church. Members, teaching the truth from house to house. Distributing literature. Conducting classes on helpful living and the care of the sick. They were so busy, right? A school for the children has been conducted in the basement of the, I can't pronounce that, but the meeting house. Right? Another one. For a time, the workman's home, medical missionary was maintained. Busy activity. On the Market Street near the City Hall, there were treatment rooms operated as a sanitarium. They also had, now I like this one, they had some local health food store. The church had opened a health food store selling healthy foods. Yes. And I like this one now. Near the center of the city, not far from the call, from the call building, was conducted a vegetarian cafe. They had that, the church, teaching people how to eat healthy and to cook healthy meals. Along the waterfront, where ships, uh, mission work was being carried on, where, where the ships came in now. What were they doing now? Other vi various line times, our ministers conducted meetings in large halls of the city. Thus, warning messages was given by many. Beloved, there is something for all of us to do. And if you sit there and don't do anything, you bind this hand up, you try it for one month. Dr. Parks can attest to this. You do this test and come back one month from now. You get a band or some duct tape and tie it for one month like this. And see what happens. You, would you do that one? Who will take that one on? Uh, nobody. You're, you're smart. It's called atrophy, wasted muscle power. And my dear friends, I am afraid that we are becoming a congregation of just collective hearers. Amen. We come, we sit, we kneel, we pray, we go, and that's the extent of our missionary activities. And if you don't get to work, you will one day drift. Researchers show people who remain in various denominations are the ones that are very active. In some line of work. So some will depart because of just pure laziness. Others will depart, fill it in now, 
Because they are terrified of persecution. You know that? Yes. Some will depart from the faith because of persecution. 2 Timothy 3.16. This is not the text, but you can jot it down. Paul says, 12 rather, Yea, all persecution, yea, all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall do what? So once you take on the name of Christian, prepare yourself. It's coming. You're going to get it. Somebody will hate you. And the fact is, if we are not now experiencing some kind of persecution, it means that the devil doesn't find in you a worthy opponent. Hey, when I used to play soccer, I was a dangerous forward. I knew the game. And sometimes, you put two guys on him. One game, I had a rabbit on me. That was his job. Follow him. This is, the guy just kept on following me. That's what he, that was his job. Get him out of the game because he's too dangerous with the ball. And so when the devil finds in you a worthy opponent, he's going to mark you. Put legion on you to throw you off your game. But if he sees you're a nonchalant, you'll come lucky go. Oh, we don't worry about him or her because they're not injuring my kingdom. But the very fact you begin to live righteous, trust me, somebody is going to hate you. We're, we're told prosperity multiplies the mass of professors but adversity purges them out of the church that's how it is and the reason why Christianity is so prosperous because there is no persecution if we were being electrocuted and thrown to the, 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 the gas people would take off but the very fact that we are sheltered we're told in evangelism 306 in the absence of persecution, there have drifted in our ranks men who appear sound their Christianity. But if persecution should arise, would go out from us. And by the way, when the mark of the beast comes in play, a large class who are now lodged in the church will go. That's a prophecy. They are not sincere. They are not true. They are not honest. So some because they can endure Christ's teaching, some because of unsound doctrine, some because of laziness, some because of persecution. Now this is where I want to take flight and tarry for a moment. Now fill it in now. Some because of the glitter and glamour of Babylon. You know, it is said the grass is always greener than the, under what? And I've learned that everything glitter is really gold, man. You've got to treasure what you have. Treasure what you have. For those children who have the privilege of having godly parents, it is a blessing, man. Now, I know as Jamaican parents, we can be a little bit too hard. I know, I know, I know. And when we discipline, Lord have mercy, judgment cometh, broomstick. We know how it goes, extension wire. And I'm not justifying that. But bless God, some of us came out right. Today we diagnose. Everybody has some... No, the Bible says the rod will drive them out. Not so we go and abuse our kids. Now we're not going to do that, but there's a time for spanking. And I know as Jamaican parents, sometimes we can be overbearing. Yes. But if you don't know better, you really can't do better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you something. It doesn't matter how, how hard that parent may be. It is still a blessing to have a godly father. A godly mother who will pray for you. I told you, beloved, I have never seen my mother pray. That, is, that was, wasn't even our home. home. You, my mother never defend religion. She never opposed religion. She was just her. I have never seen my mother pray. Never. It, it is, where's my father? He's an apostle. He just, he just jumped, left the church. 
but it is a blessing to have Christian parents. And we need to affirm them, man. We need to forgive and forget and move on, man. God is good, man. And if we can't forgive, how will he forgive? And while they are here, treasure the moments. I'm telling you, man, life is fragile, man. Have no regrets. If you call your mom, tell her you love her, send her some rose while she can smell it. The one she's dead, you might as well give me the money. Let me buy some brown shoes. <laughs> Let me look good on the side She's not going to... Exp- can't, can't smell it. Lighten her load or their load. So, because of the glitter and glamour of Babylon, Paul says now, what godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing in the world and as certain we, we shall carry nothing out. Now look how God is good. When you came in the world, you came naked. But when you leave, you leave clothed. That's a good God now. you looking sharp when you leave. Right? Then he says now, having food and raiment, be what? And we got more than we got cell phone, we got iPad, we got tablets, we got three TVs in our homes, we got two cars, we got chalets, timeshare. Anything apart over food and raiment is a blessing. Then he says now, but they that will be rich fall into what? And sneers into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Hell, for the love of money is the root of all evil. While some coveted after, they have erred from the what? Or they have apostatized. See, the Brooks once said this. He said, gifted people and pretty people are usually in jeopardy. You think about that. Gifted people and pretty people are usually in jeopardy. Beloved, it does pay to be good looking. It doesn't. It doesn't pay to be talented or gifted. Because you, where I'm from, they say, the higher the monkey climb is the most exposed. And God has to keep you humble. If you have a gift, you need to pray. If you are good looking or charming, you need to pray. It is an awful temptation. His name was Dudley Marvin Canwright. He was born 1840, died 1919, four years after servant of the Lord. He was gifted. And he was good looking. I'm going to show you now. In 1859, at the age of 19, Dudley learned about the Sabbath truth and the third angel's message. He went to a meeting that was conducted by James White. He was baptized. Elder White gave him a Bible and a set of prophecy charts. And he went out and began preaching. Later, Ella White raised money for him to have a library as a young. He was a gifted young man. 1865, at the age of 24, he was ordained by James White and John Loughborough. I want you to follow me now. He later wrote in the review, Ken Wright wrote, Present truth looks clearer and more beautiful to us and more the more we study it. Praise the Lord for a religion that agrees with the Bible. Common sense and the wants of man. And when you join this church, there are three things you'll get. Even common sense. And our religion agrees with the Bible. And the wants of man. He wrote that. Later on, he was married. He had to help me, help me to build, somebody say. <laughs> but he had a love for knowledge. And in 1880, he wanted to sharpen his oratorical skills. And so he was enrolled in the Chicago School of Elocution. 
When he left this school, the brother's vocabulary was like this. They said, Dudley Kenwright, when he preached, his messages were like a hand grenade tossed in a crowd. They would burst like a bubble in the soul. He had the ability to use words and turn daggers of persuasion in people's hearts. This brother was bad. Now, bad means good in our modern vernacular. <laughs> I'm saying, gifted. The general conference decided we're going to have a we're going to have a campaign. And as they survey the landscape, who will be the one to lead out in this series of meetings? Surely, Dudley Kenwright. Brethren, people would walk for miles to hear this man preach. The, the meeting began. They sent a, a orator, a critiquer, to critique his preaching. The critiquer forgot the critiquing and became Adventist. The opening night, 3,000, and that was a massive crowd back then. When he sat down from the first night, Daniel, to he sat in the chair. And he said to the fellow minister, he nudged him. And he said this, you know, I believe I could be a great man were it not for our unpopular message. Certain things I, I wish I didn't have to preach. The Sabbath and death. and If I could leave those stuff out of my discourse, I'd be a great man. You know, we are told we shouldn't strive to be great. Strive to be faithful. Amen. Jeremiah says, Seekest thou great thing for thyself? Seek them not. When he said that, the minister said, hey, it is the message that made you what you was. Amen. And then you had the message make you. And if you leave it, beloved, he was courted by the Baptist church. Dudley Kenrod, listen, come with us. In our church, we keep all the tithes and offering. We can make you rich and famous. The carrot was dangled. And Dudley Kenwright jumped ship. Now, before he did, God gave the servant of the Lord an impress. This dream is an impressive dream. Before the man jumped ship, this was written. I read in your handout. I had an impressive dream last night. I thought that you were on a strong underscore, a strong vessel. Sailing through rough waters. Sometimes the wave beat over the top and you were drenched with water. You said, quoting, I shall get off this vessel that is going down. No, said the one who appeared to be the captain. This vessel sails into the harbor. She will never go down. Yeah. Quoting now. The captain quoting. Quotation marks. But you answered, quoting, I shall be washed overboard. I am neither captain nor mate. Who cares? Jesus cares. Yeah. He cares. I shall take my chances on that vessel you see yonder. Said the captain, quoting, I will not let you go there for that vessel will strike the rocks before she reaches harbor. You strengthened yourself up and said with great positiveness, this vessel will become a wreck. I can just see it as plain as it can be. The captain looked upon him with piercing eyes and said firmly, quoting, I shall not permit you to lose your life by taking that boat. The timbers of her framework are warm eating. She is a what craft? If you had more knowledge, you'd be discerned between the spurious and the genuine, the holy, and that which is appointed for ruin. What a serious dream. Now let's break it down. Let's, let, let me itemize. So we have the captain. We have a ship. It's in rough water. We can see by the artist's depiction that waters are coming in the ship. So the, the, the occupants are being tossed to and fro. But over yonder is another ship. And this man now is about to jump this ship 
to take that ship. Now let me break it down in our modern vernacular now. I believe that the strong vessel represents the remnant church. There's none like it. Some have some truth, but not all truth. And we can, that's, that's scripture. That's scripture. The captain must symbolize Jesus Christ. He is the captain of our salvation. That vessel yonder must represent apostate protestantism with all ism schisms. This fellow here is Ken Wright, but not just Ken Wright. It represents all those institutions and members who think that that ship Oh, Joel Austin can pack the stadium, but he cannot preach the three angels' messages. Amen. And by the way, comedians can pack an auditorium. Did you know that? Amen. So Ken Wright is a personification of every member of the remnant church who will think that there's something better out there. Beloved, that vessel is sinking. They are, they are deceiving people out there. It's a money-making thing. They are deceiving people. These men are not speaking the truth. No, I'm not here condemning them. But if you are a Bible seek, they are not speaking the truth. They are deceiving people. They are not telling the truth. I know that that vessel will strike rock. She will never reach harbor. Never. The timbers, the framework, it's not solid. Don't let the glitter and the glam. I told you a true story, man. When I was in Jamaica, my mom used to send money to, for Christmas. You know how it is in Jamaica. You got to have your Christmas suit. And she sent money to buy, to buy me a pair of Jordans. So I caught a bus from a crossroads going downtown. Back then it was what? Seven for one, something like that. So you get $100, man, you got a lot, a lot of money. I got the money changed, I'm going downtown. I got the bus, I made a goose. We call them today Ponzi scheme, scammies. And the guy said to me, hey, you want to buy a gold chain? I'm a businessman. Something I can buy it and flip it. So you know how it is now. He said, look at it on the ground. See, scratch it. It's 14K. It didn't turn silver. He said, how much? I'm on three quarters of my money. So the plan was, I got a good deal. I'm saying, I'm going to go home and flip it. And I'm going to have double. Didn't even make it to the store. Got back on the bus and went back to my home. When I got to my home, I told my buddy, he said, how, how are you so sure it's real? I said, the guy is scratching. He said, man, let me get the bleach. <laughs> now, where I'm from, if you want to test real gold, get a cup of bleach and drop that thing in it. He got the bleach. I put that thing, that thing that turned green. <laughs> and I learned all that glitters is not necessarily gold. You've got to test it. What happened? Beloved, what is God calling? God has people in this establishment. And the ship is sinking. And God has an evacuation message. He's saying, come out of Babylon. Come out of confusion. Yes. Because that's what Babylon symbolized. Confusion. Babylon, you get the word babble. Baby. When a baby, goo goo ga 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 ga. Who says amen for that? Do you pay money to go see somebody goggle? So what the Bible is saying, as good as they may seem on television, when they speak is, and you say, amen, amen, amen. It's confusion. So God says, come out of confusion. Now, so when he jumps ship, 
He left the organization. Now watch this now. Question number five says, now, what does the 10th commandment condemn? There are 10 of them. That's why you got 10 fingers and 10 toes. Thou shalt not what? Covet. Covet. Thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's wife, manservant, maidservant, ox, ass, anything that belongs, the 10th commandment condemns covetousness. Thou shalt not covet. Now, look at this now, right? Taylor G. Bunch, a good Bible scholar, said this. He said in his book, The Ten Commandments, he says, this is so profound. Trace every breach of the moral law, the Ten Commandments, whether it's murder, adultery, theft, slander, or any of the sins of which these are, are the head and representative back to their source. He says you can trace it right back to covetousness as a chief. Every time a man breaks one of the commandments, it has its root in covetousness. Do the math. Covetousness. Question now. Jesus admonished his disciples to be, to be aware of what evil? In the book of Luke, 12, 15, he says, and he said unto them, take heed and beware of what? For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. Covetousness. And the problem that is facing our church today is the big sin of covetousness. We are coveting doom things. Yes. Things that are, their timbers are rotten. Yes. President Roosevelt's wife visited Madison School in Tennessee. At a time when other schools were in debt, she was amazed that this institution was operating on a budget without debt. Our schools are now coveting after. Our churches now. You know, there was a time, you know, when you came to Adventist Church, you knew the church by the city or the Bible name. You know, Shiloh, Ephesus, or the city, Laxahachi. There's a shift now. Tabernacle Praise Center. Look at it. Miracle Place, Hope, Charity. There's a shift. Because these are names that these churches... And the highest point is not the preaching. You come as you are, wear what you are, drink what you want, you sleep around who you want to sleep around, just come praise him. There's no demand for vital godliness. You come the same way, you leave the same way. There's no change. Doom things. Look what happened now. So when he left, it was very sad because this was our prominent guy, man. This was, our, this was the guy. This was like the Brooks of the day or the Mark Finley of the day. This was written to him. Set the messages. You have ever had a, a desire for power and popularity. You want it to be too much and to make a show of noise in the world. As a result, your sun will set in obscurity. That's darkness. That's a predication. Now, when he left, he wrote a book entitled Seventh-day Adventism Renounced. He became an apostate. In that book, this man who was schooled in the rudiments of our faith, Denounce the following doctrines. The eminent return of Jesus Christ, second coming. Deny the binding nature of the Ten Commandments. And there are people who believe that, you know, that we're no longer... The next time a cop stops you, just tell him, judge, we're under grace. And see how far you get. He rejected 
and why ridicule the church, and so forth. Beloved, he was writing another book, attacking the church. This was his secretary. She wrote in a book, I was Canwright's secretary. And she wrote this. In 1913, while working on another book attacking Ellen White, he heard a voice said, you have grieved the Holy Spirit. Canwright said, Secretary said, I am a lost man. She was a good woman. And you know, Ellen White died before him. And Stephen Haskell, the body was in Battle Creek Church. Stephen Haskell doing the eulogy. The church was packed. Ken Wright kicked open the door. <sighs> Crying, disturbing the church service. <sighs> Walked down the aisle, looked in the coffin and said, there lies a holy woman. He left the church and came and said, there lies a holy woman. And he walked out and he sat on the bench. And G.I. Butler said to him, Ken Wright, come back and work with us now. He said, I am a lost man. You hold on to the truth. You know what happened to him? The Battle Creek was doing renovation. And he, he stepped on a piece of log. Fell through the first floor. Broke his leg. The leg never healed properly. It had to be cut off. Your son shall set in obscurity. He died a cripple, a drunk, begging for food out of the back door of the Battle Creek Sanitarium. All because he coveted. I said, Lord Jesus, you hold on to me. Amen. We are told in the last solemn work, few great men will be engaged. Don't let all them degrees fool you, because half of them ain't saying nothing. Amen. I've come to a point now, the more degree a man have, I got my eye on him. Because Paul, your offense to Paul, much learning have made thee mad, brother. I'm telling you, when you see all that, and when you see them come with the one page introduction, you know you ain't going to hear nothing. That's a setup for disappointment. We're told the time is not far distance. Many a star, we are admired for their brilliance, will go out in darkness, beloved. In the latter days, some shall depart from the faith. So what then? Is there any hope? Is there any hope for you and I? Because if, if the bright lights go out, what about the dumb lights? Those who don't even study. We don't understand a ghost of a chance. <laughs> is there hope? Yes, there is hope in Jesus. Amen. Number seven now says, Now what is the eternal God of truth able to do for all believers? He can do something for you. In the book of Jude 1, 24, Jude says now, Now unto him that is able to keep you from what? Amen. Beloved God can keep us from falling into apostasy. Amen. He can keep you if you want to be kept. He can preserve you. He can sustain you. He can keep you. Now, if you want to be kept, you're going to have to heed this now. Question number eight now says, as we close now, how did the apostle Paul admonish the early church to serve God? Look at the text now. He's writing to the early church. And look what Paul says now. Paul writes, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. All humility. So when you serve God, all humility. In Philippians 2, 4, you have the text down. Paul says now, let nothing be done therefore with strife or vain glory, but in what? Amen. Beloved, if you want to be kept from falling, you've got to begin to serve God with all humility and lowliness. You know, my grandfather, he had this little clever saying. You know, when we were growing up, man, Four of us, five of us on one bed. And you step this way. And you always had a cousin who wet the bed. You know how that went. 
and we ain't had no plastics. Hey, what is this? <laughs> and we ran on the risk of somebody falling off the bed. And one night I fell off the bed, and Grandpa said, you can't go no further. <laughs> if a man falls off the bed and falls on the floor, that man cannot go no further. So when you begin low, you can't go no lower. Amen. Only one place to go. Amen. But if you begin too high, there's a possibility you'll fall. If you plan to be kept from falling, you've got to learn to begin low with Jesus. Therefore, as you plan to serve God, you must consider these three aspects. Now, fill it in. Now, one, there is a proposed humility or humility before we serve God. Daniel purpose in his heart. Before you sing or preach or heal or whatever you do, purpose in your heart to serve God with humility. Even before you start doing the act. But we don't do that. Say, girl, watch me. I'm, I'm going to sing. I'm going to burn this house down today. You can watch me blow for Jesus. That's the wrong mentality. Before you begin to serve God, purpose in your heart, I'm going to begin low. So while you, before you begin, humility. There is an opposed humility. Fill it in now. Or humility during the service of God. So while you're serving God, ask God to keep you humble. When you're singing, Lord Jesus, please keep me humble. As I'm preaching, Lord, please keep me humble. So before you begin to serve God, ask God to keep you humble. And you can't fall. While you're serving God, ask him to keep you humble. And there is what we call now an imposed humility. When the service of God is ended. Ask God to keep you humble. Don't let the good job, my brother, good job, my sister, get in your heavens. That will stuff will work on your psyche. And you'll think it was you when it was not you. I ask him to keep you humble before, during, and after. As we close, Spurgeon says, remember, dear brethren and sisters, if you would be preserved from falling, you must be schooled in humility. And keep very low before the Lord. When you are, when you are a half inch above the ground, you are that half inch too high. Ask God to keep you humble. He said, secondly, you must shun the company which has led others astray. Shun the company. There's a story told about a woman in England who wanted a carriage driver. She was a very wealthy lady. And she had a nice horse, and she wanted a carriage driver, so she interviewed three. And it went this way. It has a powerful story as I close. A lady advertised for a coachman and was waited or interviewed upon by three candidates for the position. She put the first one to this question. It was one question she asked three drivers. The first one, I want a really good coachman to drive my pair of horses. And therefore, I ask you how near you drive to danger and yet be safe. Can you drive and be safe? Well, he said, I could drive very near any accident so long as I held the reins. She dismissed him with the remark that, that would not do. The second. The next one who came, she put the same question. How near could you drive to danger? Being determined to get the job or the place. He said, I, would, I could drive within a hair's breath. And yet skillfully dilly-dally upon two wheels. Will you order the thing? <laughs> Keep it on two wheels. Balance it back. <laughs> You will not do, she said. The third one. When the third one came, 
in his mind was cast in another mold. So, so one, the question began to put to him. Same question. How near could you drive to danger? Hmm. He said, Madam, I never tried. I never tried. <laughs> it is always, it has always been a rule within me to drive as far from danger as I possibly can. The lady hired him on the spot. If we will be kept from falling, one, we must begin low and stay low. Secondly, avoid those companies who will lead us in the path of danger. John Bunyan says, he that is down needs no fall. He that is low, no pride. He that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. I am content with what I have, little it be or much. And Lord, contentment still I crave because thou savest much, such and much. He will save us and he will keep us from falling. Beloved, the future of our denomination, earthly, does not look too bright. The prophecies predict in the near future, some will depart from the faith under one pretext or another. And the sad thing is persecution hasn't come yet. And many have departed. If it is easy for you to compromise now, when the Constitution is on our side, what will you do when the Constitution has been relegated to the trash heap? I've learned this in my short time as a Christian. What you will be, you are now becoming. And no man ever comes to sudden ruin. It takes time to corrupt the soul. One departure from principle begin the journey. Grandfather would say, if you steal, you will lie. And if you lie, you will kill. May God have mercy upon us and may he preserve us and keep us from falling. Amen.